Uh, Obey, I'm not, you know, uh, nobody tries to pronounce your last name, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to either. Uh, uh, Obey uh, is the director of the uh, Sea Level Rise Solution Center at uh, Florida International uh, University. Obey is going to talk about challenges in predicting extreme rainfall. Yeah. So thank you, Ben. Thank you, Amy and others for inviting me. Um, so we're going to shift gears a little bit to talk about an engineering problem or planning problem or, or resiliency. You know, there's a lot of good research we heard about in terms of predicting extreme rainfall. But when you try to um, plan for future, you know, what is going to happen to the extreme rainfall? And that question comes up all the time People uh, from people who are involved in uh, uh, resiliency planning. So, so I'm going to tell you about, about 10 years' worth of work that had happened in gen generally in Florida that I've been involved in in various ways. Uh, I'll give credit to all those people who contributed to this. Um, so that's the basic question. Can we predict and how much will the extreme rainfall change? And can we use that in, in resiliency planning? So I want to uh, acknowledge all the people who have worked with me, uh, currently working, um, Michelle Rosari, USGS, Carolina Maran, and Jennifer Horado. I don't know if Jennifer is in the audience. Um, she was here earlier. Broward County has done a lot of work. Some consulting firms, Geosyntec, Klim Systems, Hyperion Project from uh, DOE, and then lastly, Jupiter Intelligence. So I appreciate their contributions. So why are we interested in uh, this topic? Uh, you know, we know in Florida in general, the climate change drivers and stresses you know, besides temperature, we'll, we could have change in uh, rainfall patterns and changes in frequency and strength of hurricanes, which we heard about earlier. But it's even worse in Florida. We have these compounding effects of multiple things. Uh, for example, uh, storm surge, we are in an environment with very porous geology. Uh, urban flooding is, is common. and and solve water intrusion. So it's a very complicated issue. One factor we don't have a good handle on is this rainfall patterns into the future. And, and we know many climate models are robust uh, for temperature, but not so for rainfall, but maybe for uh, mean state, but not necessarily the extremes. And that, I think, is, uh, is the question we are trying to address. So we see, um, you know, lately we have seen a lot of uh, reports of what are sometimes known as rain bombs, um, you know, very heavy rainfall over a short period of time. You know, one on the top is in Palm Beach County, and one on the middle sort of, uh, it was um, in December, Fort Lauderdale Airport got flooded with a very short, intense rainfall. So the emergency managers are asking the question, are we going to see more of this in the future? And that's the kind of question outstanding. Is that, is that credible information to predict that? Um, and the other issue is like the Houston scenario where we had unprecedented rainfall in a few days. And, and in fact, I had an emergency manager call me and ask me, is that possible in Florida? So, so the other issue is that we have this compound flooding issue, the, the precipitation and sea level rise and storm surge. And, and the one you're not seeing here is as the sea is rising, groundwater table will also come up and that will increase the flood risk. And, and these compounding effects, you know, these, don't, these things don't happen at the same time. Um, so we're looking at joint probabilities using um, things like Coppola, some statistical techniques. We're working with UCF and water management district. So the new uh, issue with that is this whole issue of non-stationarity. Now, we know we might be able to understand what's happening up to now, but what will happen into the future? So all these planners and engineers have assumed stationarity up to now. How do we, what will happen into the, in the future? I think like um, earlier, uh, previous talk uh, discussed, you know, what will happen into the, into the future under climate change? So why are we interested in this particular, so people, uh, people involved in resiliency planning, you know, they're trying to design and plan, you know, stormwater uh, infrastructure, flooding on infrastructure, 
of various scales. It could be a small county or city. There are also, these things are in, in rules books or standards for permitting new development. And, and one of the um, in pieces of information is what is that extreme rainfall for various frequencies. And, and there are you know, a lot of um, uh, uh, information uh, in the book that they have been using. And the question is, will they change in the future? And they said regulatory criteria and also ecological response to climate change could be impacted by, um, by um, extreme rainfall. The water table could come up quickly when a heavy intense rainfall situation could increase the, or multiply the flood risk. So the basic information that we typically use is uh, what is known as uh, depth duration frequency curve or intensity duration frequency curve. This is fundamental to, if you're an engineer, you know what that is. And basically, for various topics, um, various uh, frequencies, how does the precipitation depth or intensity change for various durations? And, and these are the set of curves that are typically used for design. Um, and and um, fortunately, NOAA had recently updated what is known as Atlas, Atlas 14. The question is, are they, what will happen to them in the future if you are designing a, plan, a project for 50 years? Uh, so because of the changing environment, engineers uh, trying to revisit what happens to the, um, what we call DDF or IDF curves, uh, because that could imply maybe more storage in, in a new development or bigger structures or bigger storage. And I think that's the basic information. So. Obviously, we can't predict the future. We look for, for climate information from climate models. So I'm going to talk about. So basically, over the years, um, we have been looking at both statistical and dynamically downscaled data, uh, primarily uh, statistical downscaling early on, um, probably eight, 10 years ago, we looked at bias-corrected spatially downscaled data from US Bureau of Reclamation known as BCSD, and then came BCCA, or Bias Corrected Constructed Analogs. And then uh, lately, they came up with a new product called Locally Constructed Analog Analogs, or LOCA, which is supposedly better. And then we also worked with Penn State on this idea of um, data mining or uh, uh, machine learning using self-organizing maps. So the question is, can the statistical downscaling technique predict the extreme rainfall, or what is the type of skill they have. Then we also have looked at or looking at dynamical downscaling uh, products, uh, NACAP, um, which um, I think came from NCAS some years ago. And then FSU has done the regional spectral model, and lately um, North American Cortex model product. So these were also looked at over the years. And then the last one I'm going to mention or briefly describe later on is this thing that I like called hybrid uh, downscaling, um, primarily from uh, Jupiter Intelligence Group, um, who uses WERF model or weather research forecast model. So I'll kind of uh, show you some of the results that we have. And, and it's not a pretty picture, <laughs> but uh, the question is, how, what do you, how do we advise these um, resiliency planners or engineers on what to use? So first we looked at the BCSD or BCCA uh, from CME 5 models. Basically, we looked at um, you know, various locations in, in the state of Florida, which you know, much of our work was focused there. We looked at various RCP scenarios. And we have daily precipitation uh, data. So basically, um, our approach is basically, let's look at the historical period of 20, uh, in this case, 1950 to 20, um, let's say 2005, and see, do these models have some skill in predicting extreme rainfall in a logical way? And we, we know that they are not exactly, um, they cannot be reproduced exactly, but are there patterns uh, similar between the two set of data? And then we move into the future and see how much change they will have. Uh, so we looked at 25 models of the CMIP-5 seed. So in, in looking at this IDF or DDF curves, and there's an interesting there's a whole set of literature on that, 
there is a concept called separability. In other words, you can separate the, um, the, you see the A and the B there. It basically, it could be separated by the return period and by the duration. And that this, uh, this separability is a very useful concept if it is true. And we looked at that and we typically, what we do is, um, I think someone mentioned GV earlier, we use generalized extreme value distribution for precipitation modeling. And we looked at, um, we look at predicting uh, return levels or what, what um, um, uh, engineers call precipitation quantiles or percentiles. And so what we found out this, this data of precipitation is DEF and DDF curves are not really separable. And so that was uh, disappointing news, but we kind of continued on we we use what is known as a regional frequency analysis. In other words, instead of using one location data, can we regionalize the data and come up with a better regional curve that could be used for planning? So I I will use some equations. I know this is probably late in the day for some equations, but I'll kind of briefly mention those. Um, so basically, um, we know there is bias. You know, you see here there are four curves in here. You have the Historical curve, um, the red line, and then maybe um, the predicted curve for the historical period using a model. And then we also have a future curve that, you know, um, into the future. So the question is, how do we do the bias correction first using the historical data? How do we adjust the future predicted curve using the bias correction technique? And typically we use a multi multiplicative quad quantile delta mapping te technique, and I'll tell you why it is useful um, in a minute. Um, uh, but I think that's the bias correction techniques that we have used. Uh, but we are focusing on extreme, not the mean state of precipitation. Um, we, we found out, and I see, we'll see, there are significant biases in statistically downscale data, and, and in a particularly, and I will show you the magnitude um, that. So one of the uh, cool ways to, to look at this is to take that equation and rearrange it so you, you have a factor, what is known as a change factor. So basically the model predicted divided by the model current period. And then you, if you can get this ratio, you can use the observation for the current period and, and multiply that change factor to get a, a reasonable estimate of the future let's say 100 year rainfall or 50 year rainfall. That's kind of the basic concept in here. So we'll be looking at change factor going forward. So in this particular case, and, and, and this is the bad news in terms of, uh, you know, for various return period, as you can see, um, 24 year, 24 hour, 50 year, 100 year, you see the change in terms, of, I think these are in inches for all the models. I think we had something like 23 models look at the bias in terms of percentage you know for the historical period and this this is was kind of alarming and when you look at the sort of the taylor diagram look at the pattern comparison for various scenarios it has very low correlation and significant bias so then the question is you know what do you do with it and um, and then and I'll come back to that in a minute so regardless um, you know because we wanted to provide and look at what the future changes are, and we actually went ahead and computed what the future change might be in terms of um, you know, current to future, understanding there is a significant bias. And for the median case, you know, we had about 10% increase in um, rainfall, um, uh, extreme rainfall increase for 100 years. So, the, the big issue here is that the changes are much smaller than the bias itself. And that's, uh, you know, the statistically uh, downscale data is typical of those. Um, so then we looked at the NACAP data. Um, you know, it's a various combination of, uh, for the CME three scenarios at least, the regional models and, uh, um, um, and the global models, combinations of those. This was like 10 years ago I did this. And even there, we found significant differences in IDF or DDF curves between the observed and some of those combinations. You know, maybe if you average the models out, perhaps they will be closer. So, 
we kind of abandoned that effort at the time and we moved on. So recently, Broward County, to their credit, um, they funded uh, a major undertaking to look at both statistically downscale data, dynamically downscale data, and I think Jupiter did this uh, hybrid one I will talk about in a minute. So this company called Klim Systems, they looked at the bias correct, so constructed analog that we did. Um, the Hyperion project is a DOE project. They have a multiple um, you know, large scale modeling of, uh, across the country and Florida is one of their case studies. And when they came down here, we told them, show us that the, you can predict the extreme rainfall well using these models. And they kind of, they've been focusing on that. We looked at also the FSU Co-Apps regional spectral model and the Codex data. Then um, I'll talk about the Jupiter intelligence, but they also compared the local data and the Jupiter WERF model, uh, which is the hybrid downscaling. And they produced those results in terms of change factor. So this is for the BCCA. There is no um, you know, surprise. You see a significant bias, as I um, talked about earlier, for like 100 year, same order of magnitude of the bias. Um, so I think no surprise there for all the models. And then they went ahead and produced um, change factors because that's what the, the county and the other organization needed in terms of what should I assume for, for my future rainfall. 100 year rainfall, is that going to increase and by how much? So they, they computed the uh, change factors for various return periods um, for various, um, in this case, BCCA. Here's some of the codex data, but one good thing is that they're all uh, about one. In other words, precipitation increase for all frequencies are positive. Um, so the change factor was um, you know, greater than one. That means it will increase the future precipitation. Then um, the Jupiter group looked at the local data. Um, you know, it's supposed to be better. You know, the, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation came up with this data set to address some of the limitations of the previous statistically downscale data. And it was uh, generally better than the others, but still you have significant biases in the, for various return periods. Um, again, the, because of the nature of statistical downscale, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So in that, their case, um, they were asked to look at all the statistically downscale and dynamical downscale data, so they use what is known as an super ensemble approach. They kind of bin the, the models by, you know, by the type of uh, data sets, dynamical downscale data, statistically downscale data, and they looked at all the data set to look at you know, what is the change factor doing. And the idea is that perhaps by doing this, we could probably come up with some general change factor for now at least until the models improve what they could use for planning purposes, which I think they need because, you know, they, when you invest a lot of money on a stormwater infrastructure, you have to make a decision what to use for in terms of uh, planning. So in this uh, ensemble approach, the, the statistically downscale data, dynamically downscale data, and the super ensemble, they computed the change factor. They were similar in order of magnitude, and, and generally uh, 10 or 12 percent seemed to be a good you know, increase or, um, in terms of rainfall. So I think, so that was the analysis they did, and I want to spend a little bit time on the Jupiter approach, and this is what I think is probably kind of promising. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a hybrid approach, or what they call analog downscaling. The idea is the you have an extreme precipitation events in your historical data, and then do basically identify the extreme precipitation events in that historical data set, and then actually apply the high resolution um, WERF model to the same historical event to get a better representation of rainfall distribution for that event, and, and then basically look at a climate model to see can we use an analog downscaling type approach to look at the future conditions to see are we going to have more frequent events of this type of phenomenon in the future. In other words, you basically get better resolution, but there are two things. You get the event frequency using the analog model, 
uh, use in the future um, climate model output. But then at the same time, once you have that, you can also get an event magnitude change uh, using statistical scaling. So that's kind of a using combination of an analog um, historical events of extreme precipitation, but use a high resolution climate model to get better understanding of the spatial distribution and use the same approach to compute the future frequency of extreme events. So that's kind of a, and then eventually they, they would recommend using a hydraulic model for, for um, drainage um, you know, analysis. So in their approach, they, uh, for, the, for Broward County, they use a climate model, the uh, uh, CESM model um, for large ensemble um, that is available. And then they use the historical uh, catalog of um, ERA um, reanalysis data set. And they picked those um, extreme rainfall days and did high resolution worth downscaling. They also looked at different um, resolutions for those models. Now looking into the future, they also looked at um, future um, scenarios from CES, CSM. Um, and uh, plus they also ran the high resolution uh, worth modeling for those days that they found to have similar conditions of extreme rainfall. That way you can understand the frequency of change um, they, um, you know, as I said, they only sampled the days where extreme precipitation is likely, and they had a threshold for that. So they had, they ran a model, a WERF model for Miami area. They, they have, um, they ran four kilometer and one kilometer, actually a nested grid, and it also went into Broward County um, a little bit, but I think this is the type of modeling perhaps that will be useful in the future. Um, so it's kind of the same approach they did. They use these results to predict what will happen in the future. So what you're seeing here is the results. Um, basically, they looked at the loci. And obviously, you know, what you're seeing here is a precipitation on the vertical axis and the duration of um, um, the precipitation up to three days. And then this is the 100-year return period curve. And you can see that all the local data, statistically downscaled data, highly biased, and that's a negative bias, fairly significant. But in their WERF modeling um, that they did using this hybrid approach, um, the, the, the dark black line is the historical, and they were able to match fairly well um, that historical data even without any adjustment. But, one, one other thing they commented was that, you know, they, they used the four kilometer data, which really didn't do very well, but they had to go down to like one kilometer to get better results, and which actually could increase the computational um, load on, on the work, but that's the kind of thing they, they realized they needed um, to get those types of results. We have done other work. Uh, Florida Building Commission asked us to um, determine what the future rainfall should be in the Building Committed Commission standards. So going forward, when they permit buildings in South Florida, um, they could use this new rainfall map. But they also asked us to look at sea level rise and how should the building code be changed. And we looked at both. And for the rainfall, we used what I earlier called um, regional frequency analysis approach. That actually is the basis for Atlas 14 work from NOAA. Um, we kind of replicated that here to come up with the rain, new rainfall map for future, uh, but also gave them a lot of recommendation on how the sea level rise should be incorporated into the Florida building code. And that is probably probably first time that we change the standards for permitting. Um, hopefully, they will incorporate those. We had a workshop recently. Water management district realized there's a lot of work that needs to be done on um, in uh, in, uh, in in this region. So FIU organized a workshop. Actually, Ben attended, and I think Amy's students I, uh, attend. And then we had a very nice set of presentation from all the players across the country and also from the Netherlands, um, we, we brought them. How do we, their goal was, can we come up with a strategy for developing rainfall scenarios into the future? 
And so we have a report on that if you're interested. Um, and it was an interesting meeting, and there was a lot of good discussions, and we'll not go into that now, but a um, lot of uh, um, information in there. So in terms of, in summary, um, you know, statistical, we looked at statistical, dynamical, and, and hybrid downscaling methods. Um, but as I showed you, the significant biases in rainfall extremes in statistically downscaled data. The, the issue is these methods are not designed for extreme rainfall. You know, they may be designed for mean uh, precipitation state, um, but not necessarily extreme. So we really need, if you're going to, you know, uh, the methods for downscaling, we need, we need this, uh, the methods that are specifically designed for extreme rainfall. Um, dynamically downscale models seem to perform better. Again, they are also generally not designed for extreme rainfall, but the hybrid downscaling, which actually models the extreme days of precipitation using WERF type model, um, appears to be very promising. And one of the major conclusions of that workshop we had was we really need um, you know, good regional climate models at the sufficient resolution to get the kind of, um, you know, um, perhaps physical physics into the rainfall mechanisms, particularly in terms of extremes. And actually, one of our recommendations was water management district invest some money to develop these models. And that was kind of a, the idea. And so that's kind of where we are. That's pretty much it. And I hope I gain some time because everybody is waiting to have some wine and yes. beer. Yes. Be <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Obey.